What's up guys, this is Coach Donnie from Elevate Yourself, where we change lives through volleyball, training, and inspirational content. Welcome to my Volleyball Coach Reaction to Q Season 4, Episode 3. If you're new to this channel, I'm a volleyball coach, volleyball player, and personal trainer who provides volleyball tutorials, jump training workouts, and other cool volleyball videos. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok for more content. I totally forgot that I reacted to the wrong episode all the way back in season two, episode eight. I think it was when I was first using the Crunchyroll software and it suggested that as the... Oh, dang it, oh no, he's biting the wires now. <laughs> oh no, better be a good kitty. He's like messing with the microphone wire. He likes to sit on the laptop because it's nice and warm. He likes to bite the wires at the same time. All right, let's get back to this. Probably gonna have to move him if he continues to mess with this. I accidentally reacted to season four, episode eight, and I was so blown away as to all these new characters and also how poor the character development was, not realizing that I was two seasons ahead. I'll definitely be reacting to episode eight again and we might do something special like a side-by-side -side reaction to the first time that I reacted to season four, episode two without any prior knowledge and my current reaction. All right, gotta move this guy. This is a very interesting question. If one of my players actually snuck into an elite camp that they were not invited to, it would really depend on how they did it. If it was a player that was highly motivated and had to fight for every opportunity and didn't get invited, and they found a way to get in and sneak in, I would actually be okay with that. Of course, if there were consequences, I would support that. Like, let's say they got kicked out, you know, I would have a serious conversation about why that wasn't the smartest thing. But at the end of the day, I would actually admire a person's desire to want to get better on their own and to fight for their own opportunities in life because that's really the bigger lesson here. If you really want something, you gotta find a way to get it. And I think too often, People find more reasons why they can't get something done versus think about creative ways of how they can get something done. In fact, if a player did this, that speaks greater volumes of this person's work ethic and determination than anything else. So to me, it would actually be a good sign. Now, I'm not encouraging all of you to go sneak into all the camps as much as possible, but just take away the principle that you gotta be able to fight for your own opportunities and don't expect people to give them to you all the time. Thanks for clarifying who the assistant coach was for the Shiro Toyozawa camp. I knew he looked familiar because he was this tall Asian looking guy with glasses. That's going to be quite a coaching contrast between Dr. Wiley and the wild and free team. Dr. Wiley's team usually highly structured, very simple system, very disciplined and probably lots of punishments. And the wild and free where it's more creative, improvisation, more free flowing. So it's great that they have two different methodologies on a single coaching staff, but I wonder if they'll butt heads eventually. Of course, Haikyuu coming through with their life-changing quotes. I gotta read this one out loud. He who climbs the ladder must begin at the bottom. So simple, but so true. Sometimes in life we focus so much on what's at the top of the ladder and we forget about the first step that we have to take in order to get there. If you've been enjoying my videos, please consider supporting me on Patreon, where you receive exclusive access to my monthly live Q&A sessions, monthly podcasts, my private blog, behind the scenes footage, and more. And let's get this Haikyuu party started. Oh, he knocked those dramatic entrance. Ooh, maybe he's finally fully embraced his role as the best ball boy he can be, which includes a little cleanup. You see he's got some mops, providing water, shagging balls. Tendo giving him no respect. Who said I hate it? I wasn't sure if Ushiwaka said I hate it or Hinata said. Hate it. I like how this opening scene is starting with Hinata with like a frustration pose. He's crawling up, mustering the energy to stand up. So I think this intro is definitely more relevant knowing the story right now. I actually do like the opening text animation. I know I missed it the, the first time around. I'm gonna skip the rest because we've already seen this. Perspective. That is true. 
and not the changing perspective. Oh, we gotta go back there. If you zoom in here on the towels over number nine, I think that's Suki on the floor and then this tall guy over here. Notice that the towels don't have any hard outlines on the edge. If you look at the rest of the drawings around the guy's jersey on number nine, they have a black line around the shorts around the body, which is pretty normal for animation and illustration because you're trying to help the viewer identify exactly the image that's going on and no confusion. But the reason why they don't put a line around the towel is because you're trying to communicate the texture of the towel. And one way to do that is to have no line to make it feel like a softer edge. So really cool touch here. They also do that along the walls, but it's especially impressive that they did it on the characters. Very Japanese. Put everything you can into every task you do. Uh-oh. <laughs> He's so focused on one thing that he forgets another thing. Pretty typical Hinata. Oh, and now you gotta lay them with as best precision as possible. Hey. The obligatory hand up volleyball apology. Yeah, this animation. I know you guys said it's not gonna decline until later, but this animation is always not as good so far. Some reading instruction from Nishinoya Spike Form. There aren't as many frames, so the animation is a little bit less fluid. Good point, Hinata. When people play defense, usually people are more impressed with the flashy movements, like breaking the platform, throwing the arms up. And it's really important that when you're passing the ball, you have to be as calm as possible. It's not to say that you can't dive for it and do a one-hand save, because you do need to do that when you're trying to go all out for a ball. But Hinata is bringing up a lot of good points here, especially about reading. Look at where the spike is coming from. Watch the approach of the hitter, so the angle of their hitting approach, and try to line up with their power line, which is pretty much where they're facing and where their approach is coming from. And that's usually gonna reduce the distance of variation of where the ball's gonna go. And then once you do make a move on the ball, try to limit the amount of movement, because the more movement you add, the more momentum you're gonna carry into the ball. So if I have a bad movement and I make a bad read to my left or my right, I'm gonna carry that lateral momentum. Whereas if I have minimal movement, even if it's not the best controlled dig, it's not going to exaggerate the error that I just made. And more importantly, when you're digging a spike, people are hitting their hardest. So you don't need to add energy to the ball. You need to reflect it or absorb it, which requires less movement. So great insight here from Hinata. That is true. Having long arms makes passing a lot easier. Yeah, I guess that is a good view to watch the libero from the behind it, because you get to see what the libero is looking at. Great observation. <laughs> I always laugh when I see Tendo do stuff. Oh, the serving specialist here. Oh, the drop step. Nice, receive it! Are they gonna replay that? Is he gonna replay his footwork? Okay, no he's not, so I'm gonna take the time to explain this. So first we'll watch the libero from the back. He starts in his ready medium posture, where you're not too low, not too high, because you still need to be mobile. And the right, when he's about to make a move, 
he kind of pops up on his legs and he taps the floor. And that gives you a little bit extra spring to make a move. And I've seen people succeed in both ways. I've seen the barrels be very still and then react to the ball. I've also seen the barrels have to get that extra momentum, which is called, I think they call it a drop step, where you just hop a little bit and that gives you a little bit more reactive energy to spring in multiple directions. So I, I tend to use both techniques. It depends on the serve. If it's a float serve, I try to be pretty calm. If it's a jump serve and I'm I'm really having trouble moving my feet, then I'll apply the, the drop step. Let's watch this again. See how he kind of taps the floor and that allows him to spring to the side, making a quick move. Good angle on that platform. Oh, he's gonna hit the overpass. But the libero's gonna read it. Thank you. Thank you. This must be a flashback. That's a good trade-off. Help someone who wants to work on their skills, even if it's a different sport, and then they'll help you. <laughs> uh, being relaxed is very important to being able to move. One of the best players I coached, Will Claypeck, was a tennis player. They're great at lateral movement, just fast on their feet. Strapper, split step. <laughs> oh, maybe, okay. Yeah, I think it is called the split step. Maybe not the drop step. That's a different technique. Dustin Watton goes into detail on how to do this, so definitely follow his Instagram for that. Oh, yeah, mimic his movements. Oh, ho. And he had reaction to, in time to react to the shank, but he still got hit in the face. <laughs> Smiling with a bloody nose. <laughs> That's funny. Now he's gotta be a ball boy with a tissue up his nose. That's exactly what you want to do as a ball boy. It's a free opportunity to study great volleyball. Yeah, they cheated. They replayed that animation. You see that? This is the same animation they used for the libero a couple minutes ago. Now, I don't recommend passing or squatting this low. This is like more of an emergency situation when you have to be in an awkward position. One, very few people have the mobility to even get this low. I mean, you should just try it right now to see if you can get your shoulders all the way down to your knees without lifting up your heels. That requires a lot of ankle, hip, and knee mobility. Instead of squatting down, you should actually just step forward or dive forward because you're not going to get a lot of control when you're squatting this low. When people say get low on defense, they should just mean generally low because a lot of people take that too literally and they try to get as low as possible and you will realize that I have no control and very little stability at that height. And also everyone's low is gonna be different based on their height and their body type. The reason why shorter people generally are good at passing is because, or I'll say good at passing, better at passing than taller people is because they're already lower to the ground due to their height. So if I'm a shorter player, I actually don't need to get super low. If I'm taller, probably have to work a little harder to get lower 
so I might actually have to squat lower to the ground because I'm so high. But once again, it depends on everyone's mobility and body type. But make sure your knees are bent, ankles are soft, and your hips are back, and that's generally going to be a good position to be in when you're passing. Yep, you don't always have to use the split step. Yes, indeed. Sometimes it's easy to forget to step back and just watch and observe. <laughs> Even the washing machines are great. <laughs> Of course, Dr. Wiley finding ways to keep Hinata down. Oh, is Tendo going to be a nice guy and let him sleep over? Hinata Shoyu. I'm curious what Ushiwaka meant by that, as in don't encourage this behavior by helping him out. Oh, this is Hinata's dream come true. For someone to stay after and want to practice with them. Kindaichi. Coaches are gone. This is not his chance to steal some reps in. <laughs> yeah, he forgot what it's like to be in that position because he's surrounded by so many great players. Yeah, a little, little bit of compliments go a long way. Oh, he gets a chance to, to work on a split step. By the way, if anyone is actually from Japan or has played club volleyball in Japan, I'm really curious on whether players are actually allowed to be in the gym by themselves or if this is just specific to the anime. I know it, it seems like an odd question to ask, but being a coach in America, there always has to be an adult in case a player injures themselves or something goes on. There always just needs to be adult supervision or maybe players end up doing some bad stuff to each other, like bullying each other or something worse. But mainly it's a liability thing as to why we don't allow high school students to just be in the gym by themselves. And if they do injure themselves, the coach in charge still gets in trouble even if they weren't there because it's their fault for letting the players be in the gym in the first place. So I'm curious if this is just a cultural thing where there's a lot of trust in Japan where players are just allowed to practice and play whenever they want, which is awesome. I mean, that I would love that if I was a high school kid or if this is just the anime itself and they're just adding a little bit of flair to the story. Oh, right through his feet. Well, that's normal. Every time you try something new, you're going to be a little bit slow to apply it first. Oh, he's using the ball shagging as a chance to practice. I thought he was actually trying to dig some stuff. Man, that's way too many steps for an approach. This is awesome. He is using his ball shagging as a way to practice reps. He's better, better at reading. Yeah, the set was dying inside a little bit, so he's forced to hit the angle. Yeah, push 
pushing the, the set wider, otherwise you cannot hit line. I'm going to add to what Hinata is actually trying to apply here using the ball boy shagging drill as a way to practice reading hitters. Whenever you're doing a serve receive drill and most practices, you're going to have three passers, one target, and then a couple servers on the other side, right? A very basic serve and pass drill. Only one person can serve and more importantly, only one person can actually pass the ball at one time. So. The other two passers, it's very easy for them to mentally check out, especially if they don't get served maybe four or five times a row. They just kind of stand there and say, oh, well, I'm just going to relax until the ball comes to me. But here's a great example. And I, I tell this to my players and I actually make this a focus of our servant pass drills that even when you don't pass the ball, it's your chance to practice something, whether it's reading, calling, moving. But there's no such thing as a missed rep. Every time someone touches a ball, whether it's you or somebody else, there's always something you can learn from that moment. So let's say in the serving pass drill, someone is serving down the line and I'm playing middle back and they're serving to my player on the left. Even if I'm not passing the ball, I can work on reading the trajectory. I can mentally visualize what it's like to be the person on the left and I can see if it's short, deep. I can practice calling. I can move toward the ball but there's always something you can actually apply even if the ball is actually not coming to you because when it does come to you, you already have those habits built in place. But more importantly, you're not wasting time in practice because let's say you only pass one ball every three to four serves. If you're only waiting for that one ball every four serves to work on something versus working on something every ball, you're gonna get better four times faster if you do something every single touch of the ball whether or not you touch it. The other player was looking at him from Josai. Like, what the heck is he not so excited about? Yeah, where's this guy gonna go? Is he gonna go all the way home? Oh, little Suki leaving some food for Hinata. Ah, uh, okay, so he is riding the bike home and taking the bus. It's interesting that hearing that scene with the new Coach Ukai voice. Yeah, he needs to pack food next time. We think Japan is generally pretty safe because for a young high school boy walking home alone, not always the best idea in America. Kochi! Coach Ukai might be picking him up. Sports drink. Good recommendation. Get some electrolytes in your body. Oh, he's taking notes. Oh, this is a great recommendation. <laughs> he repeated what he said at the end. <laughs> I gotta watch that scene again. I don't know why I found that so funny. Because <laughs> they both they both emphasize that at the end. I gotta say, this is every coach's dream for a player to take their nutrition seriously. I'll be honest, you can actually improve your performance by 30 to 40 percent if you actually really focus on your nutrition, tracking your protein, carbohydrates, timing your meals, eating the right foods, and then also sleeping enough. It's not the most flashy thing to do, so a lot of people don't do it, but for sure it makes a huge difference. Also, it's a coach's dream to want to take notes on what the coach is telling you. So I can tell that Coach Ukai is pleasantly pleased with this surprise conversation with Hinata. <laughs> Oh, they're looking up at the same sky. Yeah. Even he's excited. Oh, he took his toothbrush in case he was going to sleep over. But Dr. Wiley was a mean guy. 
it's so awesome that he really finally took this opportunity and take advantage of it, even if he's not touching the ball. Tokonami. This must be one of their scrimmages that they have during the offseason. So true. Great words of wisdom. Regardless of the atmosphere, create the same habits and routines. Yeah, Yamaguchi psyched himself out. And I'm glad he gets a chance to practice. A little bit tight on that set. This is a great opportunity for Tsuga to get more playing time now that Kageyama's at another training camp. <laughs> Somehow stupidly cool. Man, serving routines are so important. <laughs> so cool. That's the... Oh, man. Speaking of routines, serving routines are very important, and that's one of the best ways to be able to keep a consistent serve, regardless of where you're playing, how big the crowd is, all those things that Coach Ukai mentioned, because that's all you have control over. And if you make your routines consistent, your serve will be consistent, regardless of external factors. But I do love it when I see a player with a overly flashy serving routine take all this time and then either hit the easiest serve or to hit a serve right into the net i remember this one player at uc davis when i was playing in college this one guy i'm not going to say his name because i don't want to put him on blast but he would have like a 20 second serving routine and i remember i memorized it not because i was trying to memorize it but because it took forever and i saw it for like three years straight. He would take the ball, take a deep breath, and just look dramatically on the other side, and then spin it slowly like three times, and then bounce it on the floor, and then toss it really high. And he would add like a little extra flick to his toss. And then he would go for the serve, and it would be like a down ball. It would be the easiest serve in the world. I'm thinking like, why would you go through all that trouble just to serve an easy serve? Like just do a float serve, which would probably be tougher. And my teammates and I, we would joke about him all the time and we'd try to imitate his serving routine <laughs> during our own practice. That just reminded me so much of that. Now, none of those things are bad in themselves. Like to actually serve powerfully, you generally need to toss the ball really high. And yes, a little extra flick does help. Spinning the ball, bouncing the ball, those are all really good parts of a serving routine. But if you're not gonna blast it or do something that justifies that long serving routine, don't do the serving routine. It just looks like you're doing it for show. And maybe Tanaka right here is doing it for show. Tokonami, have we seen them yet? right they remember the work that was required to get them to that level they're also playing without three of their better players Hinata, Kageyama and Suki those are the best scrimmages when you get a chance to develop other players this is another great coaching opportunity Great read, Hinata. When this when the set is higher off the net, they will hit it deeper because they can't hit it straight down. Oh, that is an interesting contrast. When Hinata was first ball shagging on day one, he was running all over the place. Now he's actually able to read where they're hitting. And this coach is observing that too. That's right.
<laughs> Seemed like he didn't even know the basics. <laughs> I don't know if he was that bad. <laughs> Everyone thinks so lowly of Hinata. Uh, he's apologizing to him in his head. <laughs> Everyone just sees Hinata as a simpleton. Which he is. But there's a little deeper things going on in his head. Yes, once you get set up early enough in the defensive posture or position, you can apply the split step. It's about getting set up in your defense first. Did he pack a lunch? Or is Suki gonna sneak him some food? This was an interesting dramatic change in scene. Oh, Ushiwaka is just observing. <laughs> More zombie analogies from Tendo. Uh, Ushiwaka probably has some secret respect. To want to beat someone, you have to respect them to a certain level. <laughs> Why are you always so desperate? That's an interesting question. Oh, totally forgot about the separate practice. I was so engrossed in the Miyagi Prefecture practice, but man, to see him practicing at the youth national team practice, can't wait. Man, that was a great dig. Is he going to struggle or will he shine? Oh, now we get to see the germaphobe. Man, these guys are hitting super hard. Oh, he's not used to people challenging. Is Bokuto there? I think that is Bokuto. It's kind of hard to recognize these new animations from season three to now. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you get a little nervous. Or maybe he's used to setting Hinata super fast. Oh, that's all we get to see from the youth training camp? Alright, I'm going to try not to pick on the Season 4 animation too much because... I think the subject matter has been overly emphasized and also due to budget restrictions and the pandemic and all that stuff. So I'm trying to be understanding of the situation, but I can't help but comment on a few of the things that are lacking just because I've been commenting on all the animation and illustration details from previous episodes. So this is where we start to see the decline of the quality of work. And if we zoom into the shoes, there's no detail in the shoes and there's very few wrinkles in the clothing. Everyone looks a little boxy. If you even look at the, the line of the bottom of the shirt, it's just a, a parallel line. There's no wave to it. The body proportions are a little bit off. If you look at Hinata, you see how his hands are at his waist. That means his arms are super short. If you stand up, you'll see how your hands go all the way down to your mid thigh or your groin for most people, like I mentioned in a previous uh, episode. And even some of the facial details, there's four people that are lacking any facial detail at all. It's just a blank face. So this just feels very cheap quality, unfortunately. However, the illustration is still on point. I mean, look at the quality of the hardwood. Look at the curtain, how every wrinkle is different. I don't think any of the two wrinkles on the curtain is the same. So it's weird how there's such a extreme contrast between 
the illustrator and the animators. That would make sense because for illustration, you're gonna have a still image that's gonna last for five seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, and you can actually reuse a lot of those illustrations. So maybe that was their way of being more cost effective, spending time on a good illustrator to make the environment feel better and to have that be a priority versus spending more money on a better quality animator and having a lower quality illustrator. I don't know, those are my thoughts. You guys probably know more about the budget constraints of the animations of the show. So I'd be curious to hear your thoughts as to why the illustration quality went up, but the animation quality went down and what goes into that. Don't hate on someone's excitement. Yeah, he's practicing his defensive routines here. Look at that aura coming out of his body. I'm curious what Zuki's thinking. <laughs> yeah, he's not just working his butt off, makes you feel lazy. It's making everyone else feel like they're wasting their time just standing around doing nothing. Visualize. Split stepo. Ooh, thumbs up from the other guy. That's always nice when someone acknowledges your hard work. <laughs> we gotta watch that again. I did not expect that one. I was even enjoying the compliment. <laughs> oh man, I love the humor in Haikyuu. <laughs> That's right, Dr. Wiley scolding him every moment he can. Ah, they reused that animation too. The sweeping. Curious what Suki wants. Is he gonna give him food or is he gonna tell him he's stupid? Here's my immediate reaction to episode three. I did not expect Hinata to get this much out of being a ball boy. I should have seen it coming though because my initial thought was that he was just going to hustle and use being an exciting and passionate ball boy as a chance to earn some playing time. But that would be too simple of a storyline and, and too obvious. And also, I think a much deeper lesson can be taught through how they're orchestrating Hinata's storyline of where he's probably gonna stay a ball boy the entire time and good chance he's not gonna get any playing time. But how Hinata's still using that as an opportunity to improve his volleyball play. And being a ball boy is his chance of actually shagging and learning how to read hitters and also just simply observing the great players around him and, and studying and I think he put it perfectly where in a game it's so frantic and so fast-paced regardless of what level you're playing at that it's actually very difficult to slow down and, and try to make improvements during a game that's why drills are so important because they segment parts of the game and slow it down for you so you can work on one aspect at a time it's very difficult to make changes in game I always encourage people, especially high school athletes, to spend some time coaching or volunteering for a team. You might be thinking, well, how do I do that if I'm actually a player on the team? You can volunteer and help out at another level. So if I play for the JV team, I can volunteer and help out with varsity, even if you're not playing against them, because a lot of people think, well, I can't scrimmage against them. It doesn't matter. If you're ball handling, just you watching and observing from an outside perspective will help you improve so much because you get to observe what people are doing really well and the common mistakes. And more importantly, it helps increase 
your self-awareness. Now, if you don't have time to volunteer for another team during your season, just volunteer for another team during your off season. One thing I wish I would have done when I was in high school, I wish I would have volunteered to be an assistant or a team manager for the girls team at my high school, whether it's tossing balls, serving at them, shagging balls, but just seeing more volleyball up close from an outside perspective and also from a coach's perspective, even if I'm not coaching, you're still having like a coach's perspective because you're analyzing the group as a whole, would have accelerated my learning much faster. So take any opportunity you can to be a volunteer assistant somewhere. And especially if you're in college, I think you can actually get part of your tuition covered if you are a volunteer assistant for the collegiate team. I mean, it's pretty time consuming, but you get to do something really productive with your time, improve your volleyball knowledge, help with the program, and also get some tuition covered. At least that's what they do in America. Really curious what Suki is going to say to Hinata. So we'll have to wait till next week to figure out what's going to happen. We'll see you guys in the next episode.